Hey folks, as you see, recording this video for you, the new moon in Taurus happening June 6th. It's also Shani Jayanti, which is the birth date of Saturn. That's also on that day. I'm going to do a separate video about that. But today we're talking about this new moon in Taurus, what the new moon cycles are. So we're going to be talking about the moon. We're also going to be you know, going deeply into what the moon is. Um, we're also going to be talking about Rohini Nakshatra. Rohini is the nakshatra of this new moon. So we're going to delve deep into what that is. Um, and also you can get the this new moon in Taurus for your sign as well, as always. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing today. So stick around. Please like the video. Clicking like helps a lot more than you know. It pushes the video higher in relevant video searches. Also, please leave a nice comment. Comments also help more than you know as it raises the video in searches. Many times with hundreds of likes, there are only a dozen comments and they can be disproportionately negative. So be positive. Let me know if you like this. Even just a few words really help. So subscribe, ring the bell to get notified of upcoming videos. Yes, please do that. And thanks for sitting through that. Those of you who watch my videos, you know, most of the people who watch are not subscribers. That's why I run that at the beginning. Um, so those of you who do always come back and show up, I'm appreciative and I hope you will enjoy this as well. But again, if you're not a subscriber, I do these updates a couple times a week so you can stay up to date. So we're going to dive in here with the moon, uh, Chandra, as it says down here, abounding in Vata and Kapha and filled with knowing is the moon of round body, oh, twice born auspicious looks of sweet speech, fluctuating, and lovesick. That's a lot. So the moon astrologically is the mind, consciousness, the heart. Notice I didn't say emotions yet. We identify with the emotions because we live on the surface, because that feeling, that heart, that love, that devotion is like the depth of the ocean. But the ocean isn't just the waves. It's not just the surface. That's what emotions are to the heart. Your feeling potential is much deeper than your emotional potential because the emotions are of the moment. Keep that in mind. Emotions of the moment. But the feeling nature, your capacity to feel, is much deeper than your capacity to control your emotions, for example. So even on that level, just understanding these things is very important. Many of us don't even understand that thing I just said. It's all, well, I'm emotional, I'm feeling. The emotions, and, and again, we use the term emotions like it's the highest, like it's the culmination of our feelings. It's not. So we don't understand the nature of our emotions and of our heart. Instead, what winds up happening is we examine our emotions constantly, trying to understand why the, it's like trying to understand why the water keeps changing. You can do it forever. Instead of, let me understand the depth. Let me understand the source. Let me understand my nature as consciousness. Let me understand the moon as consciousness. By the way, that's what I do in this interactive ebook, if you're interested is first examine the nature of what the, not, not what the moon is, what your feeling potential is, what your consciousness is. So the reason that's important to start off here as well is because the moon is moving around the zodiac all the time. And when it comes into the same place as the sun, we have the new moon, which means it's where the cycle starts over again, where we get emptied out as the moon is getting darker in the sky, literally, we see it's getting weaker and weaker as far as brightness. And then on the new moon, it joins the sun. And what it's it's like a death and a rebirth. We act as though we're so scared of death, we die and are reborn like 12 times a year in these cycles. This is why as the moon gets darker toward that rebirth and that new moon, we're challenged to let go of things, to purge things, to let go of the painful aspects 
of the previous cycle. So this new moon in Taurus comes at the end of the previous um, lunation cycle in Aries. And again, relative to where Aries falls for you and where Taurus falls for you, you can understand your, your current cycle. So that's what this new moon for all 12 signs is about. That's why I do these. And I've been doing these things for more than 10 years. Because again, this new moon in Taurus, Taurus is a universal cycle that we're going to be living and what we're going to delve into. But like if you're a Aquarius person, it's going to put emphasis on your fourth house of home, heart. If you're Pisces, it's your third house of ideas, friends. If you're Sagittarius, it's your sixth house. So again, it's all these cycles are happening. These cycles of birth and death are happening all the time. These like these like month long, two weeks at a time because we have full moons and new moons. So this new moon is a time of rebirth and renewal around the Taurus theme. So the Taurus theme is the thing we all share about Taurus, Rohini, growth. But that's going to fall in a different aspect. If you're a Leo, that's in your career. Your 10th house is governed by this Taurus principle. If you're Libra, it's your 8th house. Again, so you want to understand this is the nuance and the complexity of why it's very important just to stay aligned and check in with these cycles. But the universal things that we can know about Taurus is that Taurus is a, it's an earth sign, it's ruled by Venus, and it shows where the moon is also even exalted there. Even as it says um, here, it, it says that the moon is that gentle planet of tenderness and utter selflessness. The mother selflessly suckling the child is the perfect archetype. Yet in other ways, there's a certain terror associated with such states of selflessness and the emotions that result. So that's the moon. That's why the moon has all this fluctuating emotions. And that mother selflessly suckling the child is the perfect archetype. Now, the moon is uh, rules the sign of cancer. But that suckling, nurturing beauty that comes with a stable connection of like a mother holding the child and every, and again, that kind of stable capacity to just give selflessly is exemplified by Taurus. So this new moon is exalted. It's an exalted cycle. Now, again, the moon keeps moving, but it's important when we look at these cycles to analyze the dignity of the moon and then all these other planets as well. And there's a lot, obviously. So this is an exalted moon in its highest, most stabilized position. Be and, and so it's a cycle that begins with that idea. And so it's exalted in Taurus because this archetype of like the mother selflessly suckling the child, that stable beauty and joy is exemplified. Yet in other ways, there's a certain terror associated <clears throat> with such states of selflessness and the emotions that result. That's shown by the debilitation point of the moon is in Scorpio. Where there's like, again, the mother selflessly suckling the child is fine, is beautiful. But then there's like, oh my God, but what happens if, if someone takes my child away or my child gets sick or someone threatens my stable, nurturing life? Now, again, that's an archetype of the selfless suckling. But the moon itself in you still carries that same nature, that same tendency to want to feel the stability, the beauty, and the joy, and not only to suckle, but to be suckled. And in many ways, that's the thing we need to focus on more than anything as we be, as we get older. And we think we have everything figured out. We think we have everything figured out. We think we know our nature but actually we're terrified of being suckled and 
trusting and surrendering and relaxing because look at that archetype even of the mother suckling the child it's fine if we're the mother and we all have this fantasy that oh i would love to be suckled and nurtured and no you wouldn't you're terrified of that you're also terrified of surrendering and letting go and allowing yourself to be nurtured you're more terrified of that than you are suckling and nurturing another because when you're suckling and nurturing another you're in control big word for the moon. And we're afraid of losing control. We're afraid of not being in control. So many times, even people that are great therapists and counselors and healers, and you know, I would fall in that category, we're great when we're telling others what's going on or suckling and nurturing them. But then someone, because we're in control and we have this kind of illusion that we're this loving, nurturing person. And yeah, I mean, we are, we, all of us have the instinct. But the hardest thing is to surrender and let go and trust and realize that you are not in control. This is why people have such a hard time with the concept of things like gurus, teachers. And because in the West, especially, we were used to these things being so exploited, and they have been. But ultimately, that cynicism, we need to let go of that and connect with the, with a deeper state of surrender and peace. And these are big themes now I've been talking about for months because of this these eclipses that we had in Pisces, which challenged us all to surrender and let go, surrendering, letting go. So instead of being the mother in charge, suckling because there's love and devotion, which is the activating quality of the moon. The receptive quality of the moon is, in fact, even more important if we want to get to the truth, because the moon is a feminine energy, which means it's meant to it's it's the it's one of two energies that activates our feminine capacity. The feminine power is the power to be receptive, the power to be receptive, like the baby, not the mother. Ponder this; it's very deep. This is always happening, whether it's full moon in Taurus or whatever. This is just a concept, a general universal principle of life. And by the way, these are the things that I go over in this interactive ebook if you wanted to get it. But you could see with this full moon up here in Taurus, there's all this energy. It's the sign of Taurus where it's exalted, and Venus, the ruler, is there showing this capacity for connection to the heart and those stable, solid things. But Venus joined a new moon is nothing new because Venus and the sun are always very close. Mercury is also there. Again, that's nothing new either. You often see Mercury and Venus joined a new moon because they're very close to the sun from our vantage point. But it's, it's not indispensable either because Taurus is a sign where Venus and Mercury are very powerful. They're in good, what's called dignity here. They're not in such great dignity over here the last couple months. In Pisces and Aries, Mercury and Venus are not in such great dignity, particularly Mercury was retrograde, they've been combust, there's been all kinds of things. Venus is actually exalted in Pisces. But aside from that, so th there's a lot of energy in this new moon revolving around Mercury and Venus and a joy and love of being creative again. Because again, we've really come through a lot of Challenging energy with the recent eclipse cycle. And even as you see, Mars just broke free of that eclipse point as well. It's almost like we've had this eclipsing energy and this energy of loss and purging for months now, since like March. As soon as those planets went into Pisces and got near Rahu and Ketu, it was the Sun, Mercury, Venus, then Mars came behind it. Now Mars finally went into Aries, so we feel empowered and clear. And these planets, Mercury, Venus, of course, Jupiter is also there, which I'll talk about in a minute. But they're in, they're also in good dignity in Taurus, where it feels like, okay, now I feel like I'm back on the Earth again. It's kind of like we've just been blasted into this confusing alternative reality of Pisces for months and months now. So you can also see why I have why I spoke about the lingering effects of eclipses. And whatnot, if you've been watching my updates for months, this isn't new. But it's a progression. So having 
this new moon in Taurus where we're settling into that grounded, practical, earthy potential to enjoy life and grow and be creative. It's a big shift because we're coming out of the previous shift of Aries where Mars was in Pisces and eclipses and there's still combustion and all other kinds of things going on, which are nuances and I'll talk about them briefly. But for the most part, this is, this really kind of feels like a, like a reset after months of especially the eclipse and all that Pisces energy and the concept of letting go and surrendering. That's why I'm also talking about that quite a bit with this metaphor of the mother suckling the child. The hardest thing is for us to be the child and we are the child. You're a child of the cosmos. You're a child of the universe. You didn't create all of this. The divine mother did. And the divine mother is still nurturing and suckling and feeding you all the time. The sun is rising. Fruits are, um, you know, fruits are being born in trees and there's food and sustenance and love and joy and beauty. And you're not doing any of it. You're just the lucky recipient of it all. So you're already being nurtured and suckled by the divine mother. It's just your ego, again, People are resistant when I talk about ego. They think, well, I don't have a big ego. Ego just means the illusion that you are in control or that you really understand all of this. You don't. And again, sometimes people, I don't. Sometimes people that don't like when I say this stuff because it's insulting to their ego. <laughs> and yes, egos do not like this kind of thinking. Because it's destructive to the ego, but it's also creative to your true nature. And all of these things are important on new moons. When I said earlier that as the moon starts waxing toward new, there's a, there's a feeling of letting go, a feeling of loss. The first thing that comes into the mind is, oh, well, that's not good. I don't like to feel that. It's not that you don't like to feel it. Your ego doesn't like to feel it. The soul is fine. In fact, on the soul level, it's beautiful. It's great. The soul is celebrating because it's like, thank God, I can get some distance from this attachment. And the attachment to the ego comes mostly through the emotions. That's why I said at the beginning, you identify with emotions because you're ego. You are an ego. It's not, and we have it backwards. It's, in, in the truest sense, we are a soul. And we have an ego, but we flipped it upside down. You're literally living as an ego, which also means living through the emotions. And you, and you think you have a soul. You don't have a soul. You are soul. You have ego, but it's upside down. So this is what all spiritual practices are trying to do. And, and, and by the way, it's simple. That's all they're trying to do. It's not a complicated problem. But you're so deeply embedded in it that you don't see it. Like the fish in the water who says, what water? There's no water here. Yeah, because it's ubiquitous. Your whole identity revolves around it. So again, I'm talking about these things because new moons are literally times to shed our identity. That's the power of the new moon. Because most, because most of that identity revolves around your attachment to the moon, to the emotions of your life. And it's through the emotions that your life feels real to you. No. And we remember the past, all of our memories and moods and childhood and emotions and all the pain we've suffered and how it's left this residual reality. It's not real. In fact, it wasn't even real when it happened. It happened in a certain way, but we look back at all that in a very unreal way. It didn't really happen like that. What we're doing is we're re-experiencing our emotion about the thing. All of it is going through this agency of emotion. So this is why the moon is so important to understand. Now, you can also see with this new moon, Jupiter is there. It's the new moon with this Jupiter in Taurus. Jupiter just went into Taurus at the beginning of May. So now we can really also feel that guru's lesson. And not just the guru's lesson in some abstract way, but in many ways, like in the way that I'm saying now. 
This isn't just an abstraction and an emotion and idea. Oh, yeah, I get it. I I believe that. Yeah, so now I've really accomplished something. If you haven't accomplished anything. You've just realized that something is the way it is. It, you haven't done anything, though. Doing something it means doing the teachings then. Realizing that, oh, yeah, it's just my ego and this and that is like, okay. And then we feel good about it and think it's an accomplishment. It's not. It's just realizing what the thing is. Now you have to do the work. It's like realizing, oh, I have to climb that mountain. Great. Now I realize I have to climb the mountain. Yay. As if you've now done it. No, you just realize, okay, there's the mountain and I have to climb it. But, oh, my God, that's so much work. Even when we see what the goal is or see what the truth is, we still don't do anything about it because we're inherently kind of lazy. And this is the difficulty of Jupiter and Taurus, because Taurus can also make us lazy and just want to enjoy things. So this is one of the ways with Taurus, especially where energy can get kind of stuck, that we have to be careful of, that nurturing, suckling feeling. Again, we can just want to sit there and enjoy it and not rock the boat and be dynamic. So as it says here in your chart, the moon rep represents how you process your feelings and how you react to being disconnected from spirit. That's what emotions are. How you react to being disconnected from spirit. That's actually all emotions are. But you've lost yourself in all of that, right? And that's all it is. It's not complicated what's happening. We complicate it with all of the stories and all of the psychology and the endless analysis. And let me analyze why this wave moved like this. Let me analyze why that wave moved like that. Imagine if we did that with the ocean and we scientifically tried to figure out which portion of the air made this wave move up this way a little bit. That It would be a ridiculous idea. But that's kind of what we can get into with overanalyzing our emotions. They're on the surface. That's what they are. Of course, we need to understand things and work through, quote, work through things and whatnot. But it's going to be from the present moving forward, mostly. At least that's in the Indian sense. That's in the Eastern sense. So this longing to merge is the main feature of the moon. That's the main thing. You're longing to merge. And because you're disconnected, that's the longing. So then we project the longing onto other, all kinds of things, particularly other people. Our longing to merge gets projected outward, and then some person did something that didn't allow me to merge. I wanted to merge with this person, but they didn't want it or, or whatever. Again, and we won't look at the original problem, which is that I don't know myself. So I put all of my, my salvation and my desire to be suckled and nurtured, again, because that's also what's going on when we're longing to merge with another Part of us is we're wanting to love them, but mostly we want to be loved. We want them to love us, like if it's a romantic partner or a parent or something. And they didn't. They didn't love me the way I longed to be loved. Everyone feels that way about every person they ever loved because that's what the ego is. Even the person you love the most who was the best, that gave you the selfless love. Underneath it all, there were times when it didn't work because nothing in the world is perfect. It's and it's not meant to be. And we can't fix it because there's nothing to fix except the lack of focus on the real issue, which is your true nature as source. So the feeling of separateness to merge with the source of love again. So longing to merge is the main feature of the moon. For the feeling of separateness to merge with the source of love. And that source is your nature. You are the source. You have to return to the source. And this Taurus, this is the greatest aspect of Taurus. This is why the moon is exalted in Taurus. It's the most stable, solid, and contented sign. One of the biggest features of Taurus is contentment. Santosha, where you're content. Once we're content... which is an inner state, an internal state. Then we stop looking externally to try to bring something out here into here. Contentment is relaxation. And in Taurus, we can experience contentment very easily. Again, 
this is why it's also a danger because we can be very content and then just turn it into an emotional state and then be stuck. But when it's a spiritual state, not just of the ego on the surface, but a devotional state, then we can be content with the smallest thing externally and then just surrender and connect to the heart internally. Because when the moon is in Taurus, like in a natal chart, or now it's a new moon, full moon, whatever it is, the heart settles down like the suckling child thing, where both the child and the mother feels, I'm content with this. I could just sit here with this and it's beautiful. But it becomes an inner state of consciousness. When we do meditation, when the moon is in Taurus, for example, that reflective inner self, we withdraw our expectations from other people, other situations. I don't need this passion and this person to be content and to connect with the heart, with my true nature through the heart. So as it says, day to day, the moon waxes and wanes and absorbs the influences of the planets in the sky by aspect and conjunction. And that's what we're looking at here. The moon goes through all these places and it absorbs these influences day to day. That's why these are universal influences that we all have. But as I said, if you want to know how it affects your sign, because it's very important for me, I'm Gemini. It's going to be my 12th house. Okay. That, that's going to be bringing that thing in. So it's actually very powerful for a Gemini. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons why Gemini likes spending a lot of time alone. It's one of the confusing parts of Gemini, just a little aside. People don't realize how much they like being alone because Taurus, that most stable, solid thing, is in their 12th house. And if Venus is strong and powerful, they love to go off by themselves and contemplate and go into their rich imagination, right? So again, the 12th house is a moksha house. It's actually a very positive house. When we can be alone, when we enjoy being alone, when we're not just into escapism, for example. So Rohini literally means growth or growing. That's the nakshatra. And you can see that exemplified in Taurus energy, that inner growth, but it's also outer growth. Again, I don't want to make it seem like there's anything wrong with enjoying life. The first part of Life is being able to enjoy it so we can settle down. So it says that Rohini is said to be the most favorite nakshatra of the moon because it creates this feeling of growth. The moon is the part of us that wants to have connection. We want connection. We feel good when there's money, food, and stuff around us. Rohini is very much about that joy of life. So again, nothing I've said, because it, it can sound like a sword when I'm saying emotions. I'm not saying they're bad. All of it is beautiful. All of it is great. None of it is bad. The ego isn't bad. I love my ego. You love your ego. I love your ego to a point. <laughs> no, we all, it's not there's anything wrong with the ego. It's that it said the ego is a great servant and a lousy master. Like I said, you are a soul. You have an ego, but we have it backwards. This whole feeling of I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that, that's ego. And again, even part of that simple thought process is, I have a soul. I have this. I have that. The thing saying I is ego. Because again, you're not soul. I'm sorry, you're not ego. You are soul. You have ego, for example. And ego wants to enjoy things. And we're here to do it. We're here to navigate the pleasures and joys and desires and happiness in life. And we're meant to be happy. And happiness is our nature. Bliss is our nature, really. Bliss is of the soul. Happiness is more of the moment and of the ego. But the happiness that we often can get from, for example, Taurus, like I just said, that the joy and happiness that comes through Taurus, asp um, Taurus energy are things that are very grounded and very connected, and they bring contentment. This is how you read the signs. The happiness that comes often from other signs, like maybe Sagittarius, like the worldly happiness, or Leo, or Aries, the worldly happiness that comes from those signs, for example, are hard to sustain because they're not focused on worldly things. This is a subtlety that I'm not going to get into, but this is the principle. The happiness that comes from particularly Mercury and Venus, because they're the two Rajasic signs, are actually 
very content. They, they fill us with contentment and actual joy and actual intelligence, right? So with Venus, it's, and, and with Taurus, and again, Rohini Nakshatra especially, even more than Kritika. Kritika is the first where we're cutting the emotions. It has a residual effect of Aries. But Rohini is like right in the middle of Taurus. And then the last one, Rigashira, is also mixed with Gemini energy. But Rohini, this is the one that's like squarely in the middle of Taurus. So this is like the real, this is really the cow sitting there chewing the cud, happy to sit there and not move. This is why Taurus is, the symbol is a cow. If you've taken care of cows or seen cows, they have a couple things. They like being next to the cows they want to be with. They like having food there. And they want to be near the cow they want to be with. You give them those two things, they're fine. They'll sit there. They're gentle. They're not going to hurt you generally. Some of them, I mean, they have personalities. but And they'll sit there and just keep chewing and chewing and sitting there looking around. They're in heaven. So... The moon is part of us that wants to have connection, feel good when there's money, stuff around us. Rohini is very much that joy of life. Rohini can also bring attachment to external things, of course. Basically gives a pleasant feeling, and this allows the moon to relax. If we can't relax, we can't connect with our heart. We need to be content, and contentment is a big, big part of Rohini. It's where we can feel very content with what we have and where we feel that beauty and contentment through creativity. Again, I use the example of the mother suckling the child. The child is an archetype of creativity, being creative, creating something. And it's impossible to not be creative because humans are inherently creative. Your nature is creativity. You cannot be creative. Even if it just means creating a turd after you've eaten food. You're going to create something. It's impossible to not be creative, but of course we create more than that. We create food, we create community, we create maybe even writing, painting. Our energy is a creative force, limited, but creative nonetheless. And so that joy and love of creativity is important. The other thing about Rohini we need to be careful of is this, again, this kind of losing ourselves in the passions. Of life. And again, all of this comes down to things like functional benefics and malefics. These are deeper aspects of astrology that you can study. But again, because Taurus is going to be, for example, I use Sagittarius. It's in the sixth house from Sagittarius where there's where those desires can be distracting and da 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 da. But in a general sense, the pure spiritual nature of Rohini is that love and joy of creativity. But we need to find highest creativity in the form of like spiritual practices, highest beauty. Have you ever noticed how all of the Vedic deities are beautiful and there's joy and there's abundance? They're not sitting. Now, again, Shiva is on the mountain. He's a different one. But even when you see Shiva in a more secular way, he's there. He's got his hand up. He's got his daughter. He's got his kids. He's got his cow, Nandi. Sometimes we'd see him by himself. He's up there on the mountain as the yogi. But he also comes down off the mountaintop and fell in love with Parvati and had kids and all this other stuff. We're not meant to suffer through life. And our spiritual progress is also not meant to be one of suffering. Unfortunately, we tend to only grow. And as it says here, Rohini Nakshatra growth, there's this bad adage that's you know, suffering brings growth, suffering brings character. Yeah, it does, because it shatters our egoistic illusions. That doesn't mean that's the only way to grow. If you're just waiting for your illusions to be shattered, that's one way to grow. And some people, that's the only way they grow, because one illusion gets shattered, and they're like, when's it going to stop? When's it going to stop? Okay, now back to my ego again, and trying to make it all work out again. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, when's it going to stop? When's the pain going to stop? Okay, now back to my ego again, and trying to... It's like... At some point, we have to wake up and say, maybe the problem isn't that life keeps correcting me and I'm going to now analyze every single mistake and make it so complicated. Again, this is also the ego. Oh, I'm, it's so complicated. 
Oh, I got to analyze all these problems. The ego loves that. Oh, let me make it. Oh, you don't understand. I'm different. I know my chart is so blah, blah. You know, I hear this all the time. By the way, your chart is nothing special. Yours. You. I'm talking to you. You're not an anomaly. There's nothing. Oh, I know. But with me, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe your ego is special. <laughs> but there's nothing special about that part. And yet you're incredibly special. You're a special snowflake. Yes, you're beautiful. You exist. But there's, you're still just water. You're just still frozen water. We're all still just a, connect, a collection of the same energies in a little bit of a different pattern. But the ego loves making it so special. Again, in these new moon times, it's a great time. We have to zoom out and see the bigger picture. It's not every little thing. It's a flawed premise. And again, this is basic Vedanta, basic Indian teachings 101. That the biggest source of suffering, it's called avidya. Vidya means wisdom. And it doesn't mean just it doesn't mean any kind of wisdom. It means wisdom about the nature of life and the things I'm saying. There's wisdom, which is like, okay, I'm a soul who has an ego, who is incarnated. That's vidya. And then there's avidya, which is on that deepest primal level. There's ignorance. Ignorance of all of this. Ignorance of yourself as part of it. Ignorance of this whole idea that, oh, wait a minute. It's just my ego doing this thing again. It's not... That person, that situation, that thing, but my money, but my job, but this person, but that, no, that's really the thing. No, it really is really, that's really the thing, really. Over and over again, lifetimes. So the habits are hard to break. New moons, however, particularly after eclipses in Pisces, where the universe has been begging you for months, let go of something, let go of it. You're not in control. You're not the ego. And relax and allow yourself to be nurtured and suckled by the Divine Mother. We'll leave it at that. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to the channel.